Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. It's a given Thursday morning, and I'm here as usual with Tom Yamachika talking tax with Tom, and uh, we're going to talk today about overtime. Um, see that that's that's a threatening word, overtime. You know, overtime usually suggests something something that needs attention or else. Um, Tom, what do you mean by that? The title of this is the 2021 legislature is going into overtime. Okay, we have just uh, received word, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, from uh, Scott Psyche's office that the legislature is being called back into session on uh, July, what is it, the 6th, uh, uh, next week, Monday. Mm -hmm. That's the day. Yep, and uh, what that means is that they are kind of gearing up to uh, consider some of the vetoes that were on the intent to veto list that was released last week and had you know a rather large number of bills in them 28 bills uh so they uh, are going to um use that session to consider uh either uh changes to bills that uh, have been vetoed by the governor uh, or if, or if they uh, don't don't like the veto decision at all, uh, they they can vote to override it by a two thirds majority in both houses. And the bill. So this is this is essentially a, a special a special session. It is a special session. Yes. So the question the question is is this is this the ordinary way it works? They see some bills on the veto list. They they are. Mm, they are they are committed to, if you will. They don't they don't want to see them vetoed, so they organize a special session even before he actually vetoes. Well, that's what the Constitution of our state says that they have to do. Uh, in in Article Three, Section Sixteen of our Constitution, uh, it basically talks about what happens uh, if there's a veto uh, after adjournment of the legislature. And what it says is uh, that the governor has until the 45th uh, business day following the uh, adjournment of session to, uh, to sign or veto any bill. That would be July 6th. Okay, so 10 days the, before that, yeah. uh, the Constitution says that the governor must give notice uh, of, of bills that may be vetoed. So 10 working days before that, and that was, I think, June uh, June 28th or wh whatever that day was that uh, the intent to veto list came out. Okay. Uh, and uh, further, it says uh, that the legislature may return in special session without call for the sole purpose of acting upon any such bill returned by the governor, which means to amend things or, or perhaps override. And uh, the Constitution says that this special session must be called before noon on the 45th day. So, uh, uh, so July 6th is the, is the 45th day. So they have to convene uh, before noon on that day, which is what they're doing. Okay. Um, and, and how long will the special session last? Well, we don't know. Um, what what happens in special session uh, is that the legislature has a chance to act on uh, vetoed bills. Now the, the the vetoes can be either total or line item in the case of budget bills, and uh, and the speaker's office said that they do have to you know take some action to fix some things in. Uh, some of the budget bills to conform with federal requirements, for example, because they're relying a lot on federal aid uh, to balance the state budget for this year, given the fact that the pandemic kind of shot shot holes in our economy. Uh, so we have to uh, fix that somehow. Uh, we fixed it using federal aid, the you know the massive uh, American Rescue Plan Act package, uh, but we have to conform with the federal requirements because those uh, those dollars, those federal dollars, don't come without strings. Well, um, do, do the bills uh, that were passed were they uh, in conformance? Well, the governor doesn't think so, and and for that reason, he's vetoing uh, you know a few of them. Uh, one of them, for example, is the 
the bill that would have given $2,200 uh, per teacher. Um, and uh, the governor's veto, uh, intent to veto message said that there were um, some concerns with the, you know, meeting federal requirements in that one. I, I, I don't know if the legislature would necessarily agree with his comments, but uh, if there's if there's a veto, um, then the legislature will have a chance to fix it mm -hmm. or override the veto. One, one looking or... looking at it generally, is this um, is this package of vetoes uh, vetoes um, you know consistent with previous um, previous packages of vetoes? In other words, are there are there more vetoes here than before, or less, or is this consistent? pretty much within, you know, the historical nature of this process? Uh, more than typical. Mm -hmm. um, 28 is a big number. Uh, I, I, I think um, it was maybe a, a bit more than that in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the Lingle administration, but there you had the added dynamic of uh, the governor being Republican while the uh, legislature is Democratic. So, uh, there were apt to be a whole bunch of ideology changes and there, you know, ideology clashes, and there were. Uh, so a lot of the vetoes in, you know, Governor Lingle's administration did get overridden. Well, does this twenty-eight number reflect a, a certain mm, underlying clash? Uh, maybe not ideological, but nevertheless a clash uh, between the executive and the legislative. Well, not necessarily. I mean, the, the the way the governor put it is, well, you know, um, they 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 passed all of these bills uh, in May, uh, with the understanding that uh, we were, uh, you know, maybe going to get some federal money. We, we're not really sure how much, and we didn't really weren't really sure about uh, how the economy was going to rebound at that point. And then by the time it got to the end of June, the governor said, well, you know, the the economy has rebounded. And and we've got uh, you know a whole lot we're a lot in a lot better shape uh, economically uh, than we were in May. So so he said we don't have to you know deal with some of those uh, extreme revenue raising measures uh, that were passed in May, such as uh, you know the Enola Gay Franken bill, which we had been talking about earlier, mm -hmm. or the or the uh, uh, the bill that would. Uh, give counties uh, the ability to levy their own transient accommodations tax while at the same time shutting off the pipeline of TAT monies that's already going to them. Yeah, we talked about that last time. But um, uh, okay, so let's let's go through some of this. Uh, it sounds like there's a number of them that are that are that are based on the fact that our economy looks better than it looked before, although that may be ephemeral, Tom. You know, we do have the variant going left and right. Uh, there was an article in the um, in the Times today for the proposition that um, there are hotspots around the world now that are having extraordinary increases in in COVID based on the variant. And and some people think you know there's no exemptions anywhere, including Hawaii, for that. So we may find ourselves in a situation that is not as rosy as as he thought. Well, I mean the uh, the the economic numbers are what they are. Uh, you know, the Council on Revenues, I think, met a couple of times since uh, since then, uh, and they uh, are the ones that are giving us the you know the rosy picture. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, they Great are thinking. necessarily predictions, but um, they're they're probably better than any you know partisan politics could have come up with. <laughs> sure. On the other hand, if uh, if if these the people who are concerned about this are right in terms of prediction, um, and we operate on a relatively rosy analysis, rosy data, if you will. Um, what happens, uh, say, in the month of September, October, uh, if we find that it's not so rosy? Well, uh, pred predictions get revised. That, that's what happens. I mean, it happens all the time. And yeah, uh, uh, we the, have the to act accordingly. Well, you get the Council on Revenues they could revise, but what about the legislature? Could it revise in between sessions? Uh, 
Yeah, that's that's what that's what we usually do. Um, we we uh, budget on a fiscal biennium, which means a two year session of the legislature, and uh, we we initially in the first year of a two year session we we put in um, a budget for both years, uh, and on the second year uh, we, we we do a supplemental budget request uh, that that is just basically for the second year in the biennium. So yeah, but I, I'm I'm thinking sooner than that. I'm I'm thinking that right now, uh, his vetoes are at least in part are based on the Council on Revenues, uh, uh, which has um, you know recognized that we have a reopening going on. The economy looks better than we thought it would look. Um, but if if uh, the variant um, you know becomes a greater problem, say in the fall. How how do we deal with the budget then, or is it we just well, have to suffer then, through till next year? Well, well, uh, the governor does have the uh, inherent power to uh, not spend the money he's appropriated. That's mm -hmm. that's that's called restricting money. Uh, that has been done commonplace in 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 commonplace fashion, pretty much in every year. Um, when the pandemic was first announced, for example, the governor. Announced, I think it was a ten percent um, across the board restriction, which means that you know uh, an agency that that was appropriated ten million dollars could only spend nine million. Okay, and of course he always has the power to issue emergency proclamations, as as you and I have discussed on a number of occasions. Yes, and he's been doing so repeatedly. I think we're on the what the uh, the twentieth one now. I would assume they're less emergent now, though. Well, there's still emergency proclamations, and 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 they still uh, restrict pretty much the same things as they did before when when it comes to like taxation and uh, open open records and stuff like that. Mm. Well, this is all kind of slightly chaotic. Um, anyway, let's let's go back to the bills themselves. So we know there are some that need to be changed to conform with federal requirements, or at least yeah. settle out what is what is an applicable federal requirement in the context of these bills. Uh, right. What else? What else? Well, like in in the case of House Bill two hundred, for example, which is our budget bill, um, the governor has indicated that he would line item some uh, some items there uh, to be consistent with federal requirements, and I'll let, let me explain. Uh, what options the legislature has. Uh, the legislature can uh, amend a bill uh, that has been vetoed, uh, and only one reading is required in each house for uh, for passage uh, of the amended version. Okay. Um, what What's a reading, Tom? That's not a committee hearing, is it? Uh, no, it, 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 it's basically a floor session. Okay, so somebody reads the bill, uh, yeah. or maybe hypothetically reads the bill, and then they vote on it. Right. So, um, the uh, the legislature is, uh, they, where they consider themselves uh, bound by a forty eight hour rule, which means that the final form of the bill needs to be made available to legislators uh, before they can vote on it. Uh, so, you know, they they might have hearings, they might not. Um, uh, they they may just kind of convene on the floor, put in a floor amendment, which is what they do sometimes, uh, and and then they uh, vote on it, and and then what then happens is if it's if it's an amended bill, if there's a bill that's amended to meet the governor's uh, veto, um, then it goes back to the governor, and he's and he has ten days to sign it. If he doesn't, if he doesn't, it doesn't become law. So he doesn't have to veto it twice. Mm, good. Okay. Well, that would be redundant. He's already expressed himself. <laughs> but I suppose you could they could try to fix it. And still, if he does nothing, it's essentially a continuation of the earlier veto. Yeah. And the other thing they could do is they could override the veto. With a two-thirds vote in both houses, uh, the bill will become law anyway. But let me ask you this. I, I think I already know the answer. Suppose they try to amend it you know, to deal with his original veto. And uh, they send it to him as amended. 
thinking, oh, this is going to work because we addressed his, the, you know, the concerns he expressed when he vetoed it, and that he doesn't do anything. Um, and now his earlier veto sticks. Uh, can the legislature then override that veto in a second step? Um, not as I read this uh, constitutional provision, but as that was next year. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, anyway, you know, all right, so uh, let's talk more we, about yeah, we can't. We can't, uh, uh, you know, view legislation as a closed-end process. It, it, it goes from year to year. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so we were talking about the bills that need to be, um, you know, that he feels need to be vetoed to conform with federal requirements. Uh, is, is that a, a substantial number uh, in the 28? Uh, I, I think so. I mean, at least at least half a dozen seem to have that in their veto messages. Mm -hmm. You know, another interesting thing um, that, that had come up was in, in a number of the veto messages, the governor expressed some concern that um you know there was some uh log rolling going on and, and, and what i mean by that is that uh the uh, the bill uh as discussed in the public and has as presented in, in in public hearings you know they they you know talk about that but then what they pass is something entirely different okay and the uh you know the transient accommodations tax bill was uh, supposedly in that camp, you know, according to some people, um, Senate Bill 58, uh, I'm sorry, House Bill 58, uh, uh, what used to be Senate Bill 56, uh, the Enola Gay Franken bill certainly falls into that camp. Um, so, uh, but to, to hear a governor say that, she, I'm, I'm concerned about transparency, I mean, it's almost hypocritical. Uh, because because this is this is the dude that that basically um, uh, deep sixed our transparency laws at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, he, he, with is, a, with a stroke of his, his pen, he said, you know, the open meetings law, you know, the, the open meetings law is null and void, and the um, uh, public records law, you know, the Uni Uni Uniform Information Practices Act is null and void. And that's and that's how it was for a couple of months. Well, of course, that's that's government. Um, if you will, um, but what, you know, what about what about politics? In other words, uh, you could have a veto message that really doesn't ring true, at least not to not to a rational analysis. That is um, that is um, it is just not acceptable from a rational point of view. And uh, then you have to look behind that veto message and and see if there's you know politics going on, lobbying, uh, special interest groups, what have you. Campaign contributions, if you like. Yeah, um, I think that's that the, that's. The, yeah, I think that that is um, one of the primary considerations driving that, uh, you know, that that teachers bonus bill. Okay, um, uh, you know, the governor says in his veto message that uh, you know has to be has to meet federal requirements, but you know I think the real reason is um, that the, you know the uh, the bill gives a bonus to HSTA. Without the benefit of collecting bargaining agreement, um, HGEA is jumping up and down because their members didn't get anything. Uh, so, so I think that conflict has a lot to do with uh, what's happening on that bill. So, if you have a situation like that, where there seems to be a special interest um, persuasion uh, in the original veto list and in the veto uh, or the prospective veto. Um, I suppose that people on the other side of that question are going to make uh, are going to make trips to the governor's office and try to lobby him the other way. I guess that's happening with uh, any kind of bill that, that smacks of, um, pub, of self interest uh, lobbying. No. Well, I think that that applies to all the bills. <laughs> <laughs> if you have people interested in them, they're going to you know they're going to try to lobby. Uh, yeah. If and. Um, because we're going into overtime, there there are lots of people that need to be lobbied. Not only the governor, but uh, but the legislators are in play again. Sure. Uh, because we've got special session going on. Sure. I don't know. I, maybe I'm Mr. Smith goes to Washington kind of fellow, but um, I, it seems like from what you say, everything is subject 
the lobbying and special interest. And there are very few bills. I mean, we saw this in Washington, you know, in a in a really in a reveal over the past four years. Uh, um, and there are very few bills that are actually altruistic, you know, clearly, um, indisputably for the public good, where no one um, takes a self-interest position on it. Am I right? I mean, that's a philosophical question, but am I right? Well, you know, the uh, the law is supposed to be the science of what's right versus what's wrong and how our government works. So, um, I mean, in, in theory, you might be right, but I think there's always somebody who stands to profit or lose from from any bill. Hmm. Okay. Well, why don't you talk about some, some of the others now? Uh, I know you've analyzed quite a few of the 28. Uh, well, we've we've uh, we we have quite a few that are on uh, our list because they deal with uh, taxation or public finance. Um, you know that that one with the teacher's bonus uh, is is one of them, as I mentioned. Um, and you know, I can't help but but wonder what's you know what would happen uh, if the legislature does something like totally unexpected, like they can say, okay. Um, uh, we'll we'll fix this problem by giving the principals a bonus of twenty two hundred also, and then uh, there's nothing unconstitutional about that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yes, you've given the uh, teachers some money that didn't come from the collective bargaining agreement, but if you if you give if you give to the HGEA members too, at least it's uh, there's some measure of parity. Um, it, it it sets a horrible precedent, but uh, is is that a possibility? Yes, it is. Yeah, well, that's sort of like infrastructure. Uh, I'll I'll vote for infrastructure. Call it, you know, bilateral or something, um, because you're you're building something in my district, and you've bought me off. Is what happens. That's yeah, the, it's the, the it's the, the I game. scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of thing. Yeah, and well, that's too bad. I don't see that as altruistic or necessarily for the common good. Um, okay, what about suspending GET exemptions? Um, what, what about that? You know, on, on that one, I think the main point of contention, at least from the governor's veto message, was that um, the, uh, uh, not, not, what wasn't the GE tax, I and mean, people weren't really talking about it, they were talking about conveyance tax. And that um, affordable housing, uh, which is usually you know bought and sold in bulk, right? Because because the uh, an affordable housing development is usually uh, an apartment complex or you know some large building with with multiple dwelling units. Um, the 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 conveyance tax on residential buildings, uh, you know in is 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 going to you know between triple and quintuple, so that you'll you'll have like very significant conveyance tax imposed if the uh, if the bill passes as it as it now reads. Um, and the governor's big problem was well you know heck we affordable housing is a big priority of ours and this really you know really throws a kink into it. Um, I I would agree with that, wouldn't you? I would, yeah. and and the way uh, commercial buildings are being defined, uh, you know, through reference to the um, uh, you know the county real property classifications, uh, it it also uh, shows that if you if you buy or sell a large farm, okay, the higher conveyance tax rates are going to apply. Why? Because uh, a f farm isn't isn't uh, residential, but it's also not commercial. It, it's there's a classification called agriculture. And if you're, and and what the law now says is, uh, in order to be in that commercial classification, uh, where the tax hasn't gone up, okay, you have to be zoned commercial. You have to be classified as commercial uh, under real property tax, which usually means zoned commercial. You know, you know um, honestly, in, in the days of our crisis over COVID and let me add climate change, 
Um, you know, actually, this all seems like relatively small potatoes. I mean, we're tuning up things or maybe not um, as if there were no crises going on. There, there are two main crises, major crises, you know, the, to make the place sustainable and resilient against climate change um, and to make it uh, hardened against the uh, other possible pandemics. These are complex issues and, you know, they deserve the attention of the legislature. But if I had to characterize this session, I would say the legislature is not really dealing with the hard questions. I mean, for example, another one is homelessness. I mean, keep the society alive to avoid having everybody leave, uh, to avoid going into backwater, to build uh, other industrial sectors, for example. I, I don't really hear anything going on about that. Um, and I, I suggest to you that, that we're not dealing with the larger questions. None of these vetoes deal with larger questions. And, and it seems to me, and you're going to know more, but it seems to me that we don't have bills that uh, deal with the larger questions. What's missing? Well, I think what's missing is a you know a unified uh, way of thinking about the issue. Uh, if you if you can't have any coalesce uh, coalescing of the thinking around the issue, you're not going to have a bill. And 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 even if you have a bill, it's not going to pass. You know, if there are too many divergent approaches, um, and and uh, you know, getting uh, a lot of people behind a particular idea is called leadership. Uh, we need more of that. I mean, we need somebody to, to propose a good uh, idea uh, and and have the resources to do it uh, that everybody gets behind, and then and then and then we deal with it that way. When you have a um, uh, you know a ton of different people with a ton of different ideas. Yeah, lots of lots of things get proposed, but they all drop by the wayside as nobody coalesces around. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree, and it also goes back to the issue of um, self-interest. You know, the pe recent people go down in the lobby um, is their own self-interest, their business interest, uh, their interest as um, you know consumers or homeowners or what have you, uh, and and we have a lot of that. We have a lot of self-interest operating. I guess that's the part of the tumultuousness that the talk, you know, uh, gave us on, uh, you know, understanding democracy. Um, but but the problem is you also have to have um, the altruists. You have to have the people with the vision. You have to have the people who uh, want to come together on on larger issues and and um, saving saving humanity, saving the planet, uh, saving Hawaii. And, and I'm afraid that the group that is lobbying for self-interest is a larger, far larger group than the people who are lobbying for those visionary uh, measures. Well, I mean, and, and there and there are other considerations too, like um, you know, take your uh, typical uh, legislator who has a constituency. You know, if you talk to those people in the district, um, they're not going to worry so much about. You know whether this island's going to be here in five hundred years or, or or what? If they're if they're worried about, you know how how to put food on the table or how to uh, shelter from the elements this week. There's a, there's a, there's a priority scheme that's going on, and there are a lot of uh, un, unmet needs that the population has right now. Yeah, true. It's true. Um, but if you measure priorities in terms of uh, you know the, the future of the of the species as against what's happening this week um you know somebody has to stand up and say well you know i think i think we should care about the future of the species and i and i i guess um you know you're talking about leadership now but one my last question for you tom is uh, let's assume we have a, a leader uh, who is interested in these larger issues and i know has the capacity capability uh, to uh, to e e evoke thinking, you know, and um, and um, th commitment to those larger issues. Uh, how does that work? How does it work in terms of Hawaii? How does it work in terms of the the social dynamic of raising issues and advocating for issues, getting mm, interest groups to take to pay attention to them, getting the legislature to pay attention to them? 
Well, I, I, said, I well, think how are we going to how are we going to do this if we do it right? Well, I, I think if we do it right, you, we we need to realize that each you know uh, each person has a hierarchy of needs. Okay, um, and th there is, I think, a a uh, minimal point that has to be met before you can even start talking about the the broader issues. I mean, if if um, uh, if I'm homeless today. I'm, I'm going to need shelter today. I, I don't really have time to think about or argue about uh, what's going to happen 500 years from now. Um, How about 50 but once, years from now? But, but, but once you have basic needs of the population that are met in a collective sense, okay, you know, you know, um, then at least people will start to think about it. And then you can maybe have a chance of getting some, uh, you know, ideas going and and wisdom coalescing around, you know, one one two or a few ideas. You know, some people in the legislature are trying that. Okay, I, I hear that in you know some of the you know the committees like Water and Land and and EEP all the time. Um, but again, uh, the 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 big problems are resource constraints. Okay. Do we have do we have enough money to do this? And and two, uh, do we have the time to do this given what's on everybody else's plate and what the what the needs of the population are? Hmm. Bottom line is <clears throat> we don't do it. We always find a, a distraction. Always, our priorities never include this. As a result, uh, you know we've been talking about climate ch change since Al Gore, and um, we haven't really done anything. We haven't spent any money on it. And there's always something that gets in the way and distracts us, always. So if the process continues the way it's been going, we won't do anything. And that's regrettable because at the end, our, our, our progeny will suffer. Just my thought. Yeah, well, and if you, but, but if you don't uh, tend to the other stuff, uh, you don't have to wait for the progeny to suffer, we'll suffer. <laughs> in real time. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, the leadership is, it, it's all about leadership, I think. And uh, a, a leader, just as you say, could, could change the way this works. Um, that's not happening right now. Maybe, maybe next time around. Maybe next time yeah. around. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tom. I uh, always enjoy these discussions. We always find nug nugget, uh, nuggets of, uh, nuggets of wisdom or nuggets of, important issues in what you say and i really appreciate that thank you for having me on the show again take care tom we'll see you in a couple of weeks